Good afternoon, everyone. Please be seated. We're going to start our last session. Before we do, before I introduce our speaker, I want to remind you of two things. Fill out your um, uh, uh, forms, your, your evaluation forms, and if you do that, you can come to our reception, <laughs> just across the hall. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind. We really need those to help us prepare uh, the, the uh, rest. So our final lecture today, Goodwin by Goodwin Cook. Goodwin Cook is no stranger to the Schemmel audiences. I think many of you have heard him before. How many have? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Though he comes to us from Syracuse University, where he is Professor Emeritus of International Studies, he has become, without his knowledge or approval, an adopted member of the faculty of the University of Scranton's Schemmel Forum. So, he has illuminated, illuminated us on several very perplexing areas of the world with such lucidity and depth that we have asked him to take on the whole world. In truth, I confess I foisted the world on him, begging him to use his inimitable skills in thinking and rhetoric to give us his take on globalization for better and worse. It probably wasn't fair of me to ask him, but here he is. <laughs> We're very happy to have him. Goodwin Cook. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. And, and congratulations to you guys. Uh, you've been in school now since 8.30 this morning? <laughs> Holy smokes, and you're still fresh, and my freshman would be dead by now. <laughs> and I assume that you're hanging on desperately because there's a reception at the end, and I shall be brief, and then if you don't want to ask questions, we just tell them that's it and we'll go. I, anyway, that's, that's terrific. I'm, I'm glad of that interest. We don't have people that interested at Syracuse University, <laughs> at least not undergraduates or graduate students. Um, there was some confusion about the subject of this discussion, I talked with Sandra Myers about it, and she said she was very interested in interdependence. Um, so I did quite a lot of reading about interdependence, which is not globalization, it's something more sophisticated. Maybe I can do a little bit at the end, but it says here in the program, it, globalization. Um, so I think I'll keep my notes in my pocket for the time being, because they're mostly BS. Um, <laughs> and talk about globalization. Or, or rather, and I'll ask you about this. I, I'll do it offhand, sort of a cappello. Um, does everyone know about the Bretton Woods institutions and how they developed and evolved since World War II? If I ask people to explain the Uruguay round, would everyone feel very comfortable about that? <laughs> would anybody feel comfortable about that? All right, why don't I do that? Um, and then at the end of this, I'll talk a little bit about interdependence and Joseph Nye and Robert Cohane and some of the theories of interdependence and some of the problems with it. Uh, globalization is actually not a new phenomenon. Uh, the world was quite globalized around 1900. Uh, trade was flowing very freely after 100 years without war. Uh, many places were colonized, of course, but the trading countries, Europe and North America and so forth, were trading quite a lot. There was a lot of very open trade. Tariffs were comparatively low, and things were going pretty well. And then they had a great bust up called World War I, and the trading system sort of broke down. And the countries participating said, we've got to build this up again. We've got to build freer trade, low tariffs. We've got to build it up again. Uh, and they failed. They couldn't do it. They knew they were doing the wrong thing, but they did the wrong thing anyway. Uh, globalization uh, before World War II worked pretty well because in part of the colonial system. States were practicing what is called mercantilism. Ever know about mercantilism? A few. Um, mercantilism is a system where states trade with each other or control trade with each other and try to maximize their exports and minimize their imports so they can gain wealth and get rich. And when you have wealth, you have power, and states strive for power. So they tried to maximize their exports and minimize their imports, and the way to do that was to get colonies, because you get very cheap imports from your colonies, and if your goods are too expensive to sell to your competitors, you can sell them to your colony, which is what they did. Uh, this is what Britain did in India. They took cotton from India and turned it into 
thread and then turned it into cloth and then turned it into clothes and sold it back to India 36 times the price of the original cotton. So India got rich, I mean Britain got rich and India got poor. They took gold and silver and sent it to England. And so mercantile trading worked and the trading powers then traded with each other very freely. That was globalization of a sort. But after World War II, this began to break up because there were no more places to colonize. In fact, they took Germany's colonies away. The first thing they did to Germany was take German colonies and take them over themselves. And then Britain and France colonized the Middle East. They took over the, most of Turkey, most of the Turkish Empire, got the League of Nations, which is our idea, but we wouldn't join. And the League of Nations gave Britain and France a mandate to govern the Middle East. And they split it up. All those lines of the map in the Middle East, Iraq, Jordan, Israel and the occupied territories, Syria, Lebanon, were all European lines drawn by Europeans for European interests so they could exploit them. This is what colonialism is about. Even so, they were worried. We've got to compete. We've got to get more wealth so we can um, be strong. So they competed with tariffs and with currency fluctuations and with quotas to try to maximize their exports and minimize their imports so they could get rich. And all their economists said, this is, this is wrong. The political situation was such that they couldn't stop it. They just went on doing it. And of course, the United States was the worst offender in 1929 with the Smoot-Hawley tariff, in which we basically broke up the world trade system. I mean, world trade went down whoomp like that in the 1930s. Uh, nobody could sell to the world's largest market, which was us. I was in Canada for four years, and some people still remember what happened to Canada when we suddenly put up tremendous tariff barriers because 90% of Canada's trade is with the United States. So the world sort of collapsed. World trade stopped or went way down 40%, 50%, 60%. At the end of the war, or during the war, John Maynard Keynes, the great British um, economist, uh, suggested that we should stop mercantile trading before it started again after the war. Let's have a conference. And he called the countries of the world together, and we sent Harry Dexter White, who was Under Secretary of the Treasury. He'd been a member of the Communist Party, but he was pretty liberal. I mean, it wasn't that bad. Um, to a little place in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods, and the industrial power sat down and talked about how can we end mercantile trading. This is lots of chutzpah. This is 1944. The war, war is still raging. Uh, we haven't defeated anybody, Germany or Japan. Uh, we just barely invaded Normandy. So things were still raging, and John Cain sat down to end mercantile trading, and he did it. He was not a modest man. They put up three institutions. One was the World Bank, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which was designed to rebuild Europe after the war. After World War II, the Victor uh, World War I, the victorious powers had demanded that Germany pay them for the destruction of World War I. And the Germans complained that they'd just been defeated, so they signed on the line and said, okay, we'll pay you, and they began to pay. They started paying the reparations. Hitler ended that sometime in the 1930s. Keynes said, this is a terrible mistake. That's what led to Hitler. Let's us all together rebuild Europe. And that was the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Countries would put money into a fund and they'd borrow at very good rates from banks and lend it to European countries to rebuild their economies. But what happened? The Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan rebuilt Europe. They didn't need the bank anymore, but there was an institution. What do we do with it? So the bank became the major lender for third world development and still is. And some of its problems uh, derive from its experience during that time, and I want to talk about those. He put up the International Monetary Fund. <clears throat> Countries would compete with their interest rates. If you have a, 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 no, no, their, their exchange rates for currency, if your currency is matched one and one with my currency, one franc equals one dollar, and you are suffering, you're not importing, you're importing too much and not exporting enough, you devalue your currency, in which case my goods become more expensive and you people won't buy them, and your goods become cheap, so I will buy those. So all during the 20s and 30s, countries would revalue their currencies down and down and down so that they could import less and export more. 
In fact, several of these countries just bankrupted themselves. Their currencies were practically worthless. They had consciously devalued their currency against gold, so the currency wasn't worth it and nobody could, in the country could buy anything. Ridiculous. Keynes said, we'll stop that. We'll find a way. Things were still based on gold. But if you were running, running short of foreign exchange, the bank would lend you some foreign exchange so that you get back up on your feet and then start trading again. So you didn't have to devalue your currency. And states agreed that they would only devalue it by a certain amount. So you could only devalue by 3 or 4%, which is not enough to throw the whole currency market into turmoil. The bank, the fund has changed its role entirely since Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1972, but there it is. The third one was called the International Trade Organization. It looks very much like the World Trade Organization today, but the Congress of the United States had had enough. We are the greatest power on earth. We've now agreed to submit our currency to international control. We've now got some damn bank of bureaucrats that's gonna build something someplace. And we have to give to it. What happened to American sovereignty? We can't stand this stuff and we're not joining. Before the Congress could turn it down, they had a meeting and all the signatory states, 44 states I think, got together and put out the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades. Everyone know about the GATT? You've heard about it, okay. The GATT was a remarkable instrument. They agreed on three principles. One, equal treatment. If you have a 10% tariff on Japanese cars, you cannot have a higher tariff on anybody else's cars. Most favored nation treatment. The treatment you give to your most favored partner is what you give to everybody. So you cannot favor one state against another. There will be no non-tariff barriers. You cannot use quotas. You cannot use irrational safety rules. Uh, bureaucratic reasons not to trade. You cannot have quotas on foreign goods. The only way you can protect your markets is with tariffs. And they agreed that we all try to lower tariffs. It was as simple as that. And it worked. Amazing, between 1947 and 1987, world trade went up 40 times. All of the signatories to the GATT got richer. Some got richer faster than others. One of them was Hungary, which was then absorbed into the Soviet Union or the Soviet Empire. But Hungary still did better than the others because it still had this special trading relationship with the other members of the GATT. The GATT covered basically manufactured goods. It started out to cover lots of goods, all goods. But it ran into trouble. New countries were coming out of the colonial period. Poor countries started emerging, India and Pakistan in 1947, African countries in the 1950s and 60s. More and more countries came into the world trading market <clears throat> and they found that they had nothing to compete with. All they had was agriculture and all they could do in the manufacturing line was textiles. Most of them were in the south, most of them could grow cotton, and textile mills are very cheap. I mean, they're labor intensive. You don't need to be trained. You don't need a whole lot of machinery so they could make textiles. Wow. The senators from Georgia and North and South Carolina and Tennessee, our textile markets have been destroyed by these wretched people. We can't, we can't stand that. Europeans felt the same way and the Japanese kind of felt that way. Uh, so we established something called the, um, what is it, the International, gosh, it's down, the Multi-Fiber multi Arrangement, the MFA. Does anyone know about the MFA? Nobody understands it. I met one guy who understood it, but he'd gone mad. Um, <laughs> but they talk about it. What it enabled states to do basically is put quotas and tariffs on textiles. So we kept the, quote, the textiles out. So the countries could not export, we had quotas. I had the Malaysian ambassador came and spoke to, for my class once, and he said, you know, Mr. Cook, that's a very nice shirt. And, I, and he said, we can sell, you, I bet you paid $40 for that shirt. Well, it was 38, but. Um, and he said, we could sell you that shirt for eight bucks. But if we sell more than 100,000 shirts, you're gonna say your, tariff, your quota is full, that's all you can do. 
So you talk about free trade and democracy and all that, but you freeze us out of your market. What are we gonna do about it? Have you got suggestions? You're gonna give us an aid program. Well, that's not what we want. We wanna be able to sell our shirts. Uh, the other was agriculture. Uh, the United States in the 50s we had huge agricultural surpluses, colossal. And we were not gonna let cheap foreign agriculture come in and undermine our farmers. My goodness. So we insisted that agriculture get out of the gap. And since we are the largest trading partner, if anybody said, well, huh, why are you bullying us that way? Because we're the big power. And if you don't like it, we're going to lump it and break the gat. We'll destroy the regime. It doesn't hurt us any. So everybody said, OK. And they banned agriculture from the treatment. <clears throat> um, we changed our mind about this later on because Europe started the, the European um, uh, Agricultural Union, which meant that uh, Europe put up tariffs against agricultural goods, and it was very hard for us to sell our soybeans and our corn and our chickens and all that to Europe. And we started saying, that's protectionism. Well, it is, because it's legal. It's agriculture. And we still do it. We still have quotas on sugar and all sorts of other things. But we got unhappy about it, and the third world is getting very unhappy about it. There were some areas of trade that weren't explored at all. Services, construction, tourism, um, banking, insurance. Can we export insurance? Can we open an insurance company in your country? Can we bid on, on, on construction contracts in your country? Well, probably not. Um, and the last one was intellectual property or cultural property, uh, movies and books. Uh, more important today, uh, new computer, uh, what are you, disks or something. If you want to get a Microsoft disk, um, Bill, Bill Gates will come out of, or his success will come out of a new disk of Microsoft, and he wants $200 if you go to the store to buy it. But somebody in China will have copied it and have it here before Bill Gates can get it here from Seattle. And the one in China only costs $10. So we, oh, we've got to have copyright for this and that and the other, and we've got to be able to export our movies free. There's a lot of fuss about it. So they had a meeting. The GATT has meetings to discuss how to um, update the whole system. They're called rounds. And this round began in uh, Punta del Este, so they called it the Uruguay round. The first meeting, why I don't know, was in Punta del Este. Maybe it was winter in the north. Um, and they took seven years. It was a bitter, long, difficult, terrible negotiation. What it boiled down to was a sort of competition between the rich industrial countries, Europe and the United States and Canada and Japan, and the poor third world countries, mostly in the South, mostly dealing in agriculture and textiles that they could sell them. And we said, well, we'll exchange. They will send us their textiles and their agriculture, and then we can buy in on their construction contracts. We can open banks and insurance companies in these countries. We can end the copyright infringement going on in China and, and Southeast Asia, and we can distribute our movies and our periodicals and things much more freely than we have been in the past, so there'll be a, a trade-off here. Okay, they signed it. We backloaded it. We said, well, we'll get to textiles in 2004. This is 19, 1994, 2009. We'll, we'll abolish the MFA by 2009. That's why in the last three and four years, you found more and more that your suit was made in Jordan, and your necktie was made in Indonesia, and your trousers were made, and your ski jacket was made in El Salvador where there's no snow, and your necktie was almost invariably made in China. Um, so that has worked. It's been a lot of complaints. The textile industry is going crazy. That's why the uh, discussion in Seattle, all that attack on the World Trade Organization in Seattle was funded um, by the textile unions and by the textile mill owners. Uh, the textile workers were paid to go up there and, ah, we hate the World Trade Organization because it's gonna destroy our jobs, which it has some, but not by any means all. So that's been very difficult. Food has been even worse. Food has been terribly difficult to do. Uh, we agreed to do it by 2008 or nine. We have not gotten very far on it. It means abolishing subsidies. Subsidies are a non-tariff barrier to trade. If I subsidize an export good, that means I can sell it more cheaply 
than it costs. If the government gives a car company money to build cars and export them, that means that the cars cost more cheaply and they can sell well in your market. And that is forbidden under the GATT. Well, we kind of ignored that one. I mean, George W. Bush opened his uh, first year by a huge uh, tariff against steel so that the Pittsburgh could get back on his feet. I was in Pittsburgh, they don't make steel anymore, but um, this was against the GATT and everybody complained, but the United States is the United States after all. We still do this. It's an abuse. Does everyone know about free trade with Mexico? We've all heard of the free trade arrangement. We subsidize wheat and corn and poultry and all that sort of stuff. Under the free trade agreement, it's not the GATT, it's a free trade agreement. It doesn't say anything about subsidies. So we insist that the Mexicans buy our subsidized corn and chickens and wheat and so forth. That is driving the Mexican farmers off their farms. Well, it's what it says in the book. You have to take it, don't argue with me. Where do the Mexican farmers go? Well, they come <laughs> across the Rio Grande. We have a big wall, and if they get across it, we're not gonna take care of them when they get sick, at least according to <laughs> the president, who somebody said lied. Um, we're not gonna stand for this kind of treatment. We're gonna stop these people at, the, at their origin. They are being driven by us. This is tough stuff. Uh, the Europeans are almost as bad, not quite, but this is very, very potent stuff. We had tremendous fights with the Europeans over this. Does anybody remember the chicken war? The GATT covered manufactured goods. If you take a chicken and you kill it, and you take the feathers off, and you cut it up, and you put it in a box, and you freeze it, is that a manufactured good, or is it um, agriculture? Well, we said it was manufactured, and the French said it was agriculture. And they said, we won't take it. And we responded, as we always do when we get in a fight with France, we banned the import of wine and, and Roquefort cheese. <laughs> to my colossal dismay, because I love wine and Roquefort cheese, I find that every time we got a mad on in France, trade stops. Um, we did the same with the Italians and spaghetti. Uh, they said spaghetti is manufactured uh, because you you cook it and you boil it and you put it in a pot and you put it in a box. We said, no, it's agriculture. So we, I went to the store once and there was spaghetti for $5 a pound. Um, so we are still fighting these things. We are insisting still, although these problems with textiles and agriculture are still going on, that poor countries accept our manufactured goods at low tariffs. Some of them would like very much to block some of our goods so they could build their domestic industries. But fund, backed by the bank and the fund and by the neoliberal economists to which the professor referred, uh, the policies backed now by the bank and the fund, Milton Friedman's free trade at all costs, freedom at all costs policies, uh, means the bank and the fund are telling these countries, you have to accept this stuff and you may not subsidize. Subsidizing is bad for you. We're not gonna be able to lend you any money if you subsidize your economy. Let the free market work in Tanzania or Malawi. My son lives in Malawi, I know something about it. It's a miserably poor country. There's an article in the paper last year, I don't know if you saw it, nobody reads about Malawi. Um, President Malawi insists that he's going to subsidize agriculture for Malawian farmers. World Bank protests, the United States is going to the um, WTO, World Trade Organization, to protest that this is against the rules. We will not stand for the subsidization of fertilizer in Malawi. Uh, I talked to a British economist, he said, well, you know, that policy, uh, you subsidize agriculture, Japan subsidized agriculture, Europeans so subsidize agriculture. What you're saying is everybody can subsidize agriculture except black people. Well, that's what we're saying. Sorry about that, but we're big and strong and Malawi is miserable and it's poor. Uh, Malawi is continuing to subsidize its agriculture and, or subsidize its fertilizer anyway. And third world countries are beginning to get the word. One of the encouraging things that's happening is that the policies of insistence on utter free market economics, pushed by Milton Friedman, accepted, as he said, by Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan was a great fan of Ayn Rand. Did, did, what? 
Yeah, oh yeah, he read her, he knew her. Um, um, Atlas Shrugged, did anyone read Atlas Shrugged? It was quite a fun book, but it was utterly goofy. I mean, <laughs> thoroughly nutty. But he was an enormous admirer and backed it. That's right, by George, that's the way it should be. Free market. The fund tried to help um, <clears throat> in currency regulation until Richard Nixon went on the gold standard. Uh, le left the gold standard, and currencies, as you know, now float. A few countries still fix their currencies, but almost all of them float. Canada, fi I mean, China fixes its policies on currency by basing them on the dollar. Very clever. We let it float, the dollar floats, we float with it. But they're way down. So China's currency is probably considerably undervalued, and that means that they can export to us quite cheaply, and our goods are more expensive in China. And we have protested and protested and protested, and the Chinese are saying, well, we're a developing country too. We, uh, you know, uh, so we can't seem to get anywhere with that one. Uh, however, the fund is now insisting, like the bank, on free market economics in third world countries. And that's what happened in Argentina. When the Argentine economy crashed, they said the market will reconstruct itself. The market will prevail. It may take a generation, um, the people growing up in that generation may be very unhappy, but it'll get there. Don't worry about it. And this happened also in the collapse of the uh, Southeast Asian economies in 1998 <clears throat> and 9. <clears throat> the Southeast Asian economies, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, um, Philippines, Indonesia, and some others like Korea and Taiwan, were doing very well. They were growing at 8% a year, or 9 for long periods of time. They were doing extremely well. So the huge banks and the hedge funds in the United States grabbed lots of money and put it into these countries, put it in their banks, expecting interest, putting it in their stock markets, uh, expecting interest, tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars. And the countries couldn't absorb it all. Uh, the interest rates went down, they weren't paying as much, the country seemed to be staggering under this tremendous weight of investment, so the hedge funds pulled it out. Wham! All gone. All you need to do is write a check, it's gone, it's no longer in a Malawian bank, it's in, we're in a Thai bank, it's in, um, back in New York. So these economies collapsed, it was very tough. Indonesia is still recovering from it. Indonesia broke out into violence, uh, ethnic violence, religious violence between um, uh, Muslims and uh, Hindus and things like this. So it, it, it had a colossal effect. One guy, um, the Prime Minister of, Malay of Malaysia, his name was um, Mahathir, said we should insist that a country investing, a hedge fund investing in this country can only take out 10% of its investment a year. Well, the hedge funds went crazy. The governments of the places the hedge funds were like ours went crazy. Um, and other countries said, well, we're not going to do that. We'll accept the investment. So Mahathir had to back off because Malaysia needed investment after its collapse. So we haven't quite regulated that one. Well, this means that these countries are at the mercy of the great foreign investor. And they are, to some extent, at the mercy of the bank and the fund. Following the policies the bank and the fund recommend so that the bank and the fund will bail them out of the circumstances in which they find themselves. This whole idea of total free market for poor countries arose in the 1980s. And it has to do with the idea of development. The bank became the major lender for third world, world development. And in the 1950s, that meant infrastructure. The Marshall Plan in Europe had rebuilt Europe by pouring money into railroads, airlines and airports, power grids, roads, transportation, ports, the whole things that make an industrial country work. And of course, it was an amazing success. Within three years, we had the French miracle and the Italian miracle. The whole Europe was competing with us in all sorts of ways because of the Marshall Plan. So when the bank went to third world countries, they said, well, that's what you need, it's infrastructure. And that's what donors did, that's what we did. When I was in Pakistan as a very young officer in 1957, we had a lovely old fellow, he's younger than I am now. Um, he was a railroad engineer and he came in and he took a great big 
diesel locomotive, a huge, big, much three times the size of this room, and took it apart piece by piece in a hangar and then put it all back together again, telling what each piece did. And the, Thai, the Pakistani engineers watched and learned how to make a diesel engineer, diesel locomotive work. Um, that was infrastructure, but it didn't seem to work. Europeans, of course, were used to industrial life. They were used to industrial trade. They were used to being with machinery and factories. Third world countries never had no experience in this at all. So what developed was the capital city, the companies doing the building, and the government, which is, of course, corrupt. People in the fields got none of it. And here comes Robert McNamara, after his failure in Vietnam, became head of the bank, and very dynamic. He raised the funds available to the bank by three or four times, or 10 times, and he said, we'll do some infrastructure, but we're going to go out and help people in the, in the fields. We're going to help people generally to rise up with grassroots development. We'll do it with health, education, and agriculture. These are the things essential. These are basic human needs, and we'll go out and build these things in these countries. Um, I was in Central Africa, which is a horribly, miserably, ghastly poor country, uh, in 1978. And it's very true uh, in these villages, and it is still true today in many of them. Everybody goes to the bathroom in the woods. They defecate in the woods, and it flows into the water system. Everybody has dysentery. That means even if you're well-fed, you're probably malnourished. Furthermore, the food that you eat is probably not very nourishing. In many African villages, it's only manioc, which is the root of a tree, is basically library paste, and uh, no particular good to you. And they all have dysentery and other diseases. So what do you do about it? You've got to change their diet. You've got to change their health situation. And you've got to teach them how to use these things. So I would go to these villages where the Peace Corps was active, and they'd show me around the village, um, and I'd look at the fish pond where they're growing tilapia. Um, do you know what tilapia eats, incidentally? Anything. <laughs> and they'd put it next to the abattoir. So they'd kill the animals and pff, dunk all the junk in the fish pond, and there's all bloody, and the fish are happy, the grigs in there, and they'd come out, wonderful protein-full fish. I've never eaten tilapia to this day. <laughs> um, then they'd show you the new crops they're growing, and then they say, well, we're getting privies. We're digging privies, because pri privies are essential to health, because then you're not defecating in the woods. It won't get into the water supply. So the American ambassador in his necktie had to keep going down, peering down privies to admire them and say, that's good. Um, it's not as easy a job as it sounds. Um, <laughs> development didn't happen. Why not? So the bank went back to the drawing boards in the late 1970s and early 80s and said the reason they're doing this is because of bad economics. What they're doing is using mar agricultural marketing boards. The farmers grow the crop, the government buys it from them at a fixed price and then sells it to the people in the cities. They keep the price low in the city so the people won't riot and overthrow the government. Therefore, they pay the farmer very little. And the farmer is illiterate, but he's not stupid, and he knows he's losing. So his labor force, which is his son and daughter, go to the city to eat the cheap food. So he produces less. They continue the same process. Then Argentina and the United States and others rush in with cheap food. It's called Public Law 480. We're still doing it. Uh, that undercuts the farmer completely, so he goes to the city to eat the cheap food. And there's no agriculture at all. We darn near destroyed the agricultural system of India in the 1970s. We destroyed the agricultural system of Senegal. Just ruined it. Farming stopped. Mrs. Gandhi, very tough in India, said, we're not going to accept another grain of goods. We're not going to buy it. We're not going to take it for free from anybody. All the grain we eat is going to be grown in India. And there was a famine for about four months, and then India started producing its own food, and four years later it was exporting food. <clears throat> so they said, the bank said, this is obvious. We have to let the market decide farm prices. 
food prices. Then the farmers will get paid enough and they're gonna forge seeds and fertilizer and irrigation and labor and all the rest of the things that go into making food. Well, that's very tough on a country with a fragile government. If the people in the city riot, either the government falls or the army takes over and subdues the riot but governs as corruptly as the previous government did. So we kept pressing. That is what the structural adjustment policy is about. You've got to let the market run more of your economy, not all of it, more of your economy, particularly agriculture, and then we can help you. We'll find ways of structural adjustment loans to keep your economy up while you capitalize your economy. But then Russia collapsed. And all the economists rushed to Russia, uh, what's his name, Sachs, um, Jeffrey Sachs, um, and saw Russia a complete wasteland as an economy. He said, what they need is structural adjustment. The government is determining all the prices. They've got to be capitalized. They've got to be turned into a capitalist country. So they leaned on poor old Boris Yeltsin, who was kind of tilty anyway, he was only rarely sober, um, <laughs> and said, you've got to make this into a capitalist country. You've got to sell all these government assets to private handlers. So Boris Yeltsin sold them to all his pals who were black marketeers. And they took them over and sold them in bits and pieces and took off from Monte Carlo, um, where they frolicked and, and so forth. Um, it took a long time to get Russia out of its mess. And they said, this is going to work for everybody. So they have been pushing, the bank and the fund have been pushing Julian Friedman economics, totally free enterprise economics. Um, David Ricardo economics, absolutely free trade on the third world. They can't push it on the industrial countries because they're too big. But they've been insisting on this for the three world. And, and they're trying. And it's been a disaster. Uh, my son lived in Tanzania for a while. And we told the Tanzanians, you have to stop nationalized industries. So they sold the beer industry, essential to any African country. They sold it to South African interests. So the beer is now being made by South African breweries who are buying South African hops. So the economy of Malawi has been hurt because they sold it to the wrong guy. But the bank didn't care about that. As long as it's not in government hands, it's being sold. I think we're getting around this. I think the bank and the fund are beginning to realize how far they have gone. But it's very hard for them to back, come back from this. Uh, should we go ahead and say to Malawi, well, all right, we're going to continue to assist you even if you become a social democracy like France? We want you to be a purely capitalist country, more so than the United States. I think we are coming to an end of this. I don't know for sure, but we are working on this. The World Trade Organization is still staggering with this. We haven't worked it out. Uh, The insistence on subsidies has frozen the last negotiating round. The last negotiating round took place in Doha, in the Persian Gulf, and was supposed to bring agriculture into the mix. Many third world countries, including Brazil, which is not a third world country anymore, saying we will not participate in any more of this stuff until you start accepting agricultural goods. And it's frozen. So the whole process of the uh, liberalization of trade in most areas has stopped because the United States and Europe will not accept agricultural goods. And we don't know where that one's coming out. And this is really too bad because third world countries were just getting over the edge. Many of them, not so many African ones, but many others, Latin American countries, were doing quite well. Mexico was doing pretty well. But now um, this process is slow. What has happened is that the recent economic crisis has made it considerably worse. All economists, well not all economists, a few don't, most economists recognize that freer trade is good for you. But it's got to be legitimate freer trade. It's got to have freer trade on both ends. Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden, <laughs> Barack Obama, <laughs> it's a terrible, Freudian slip. Um, 
Barack Obama knows this. But what did he say when he said, we've got to get the, the relief package passed? He said, we're going to do, we have a Buy America policy. The repercussions of just those few words, that part of our recovery is going to be a Buy American policy in the American government, wham! That hit Africa, it hit Latin America, it hit Asia, China, everything. What are you talking about? You have been pushing for trade liberalization. And Obama had to sort of back away from it and say, well, um, th this is a very temporary, uh, uh, he waffled, no question about it. The Mexicans are complaining that they insist that we buy their, our subsidized wheat. It's very difficult not to behave in a mercantile way when your country is in trouble. The Congress wants action. So the president, despite I think his very good intentions, has been backing away from this. Americans, for Americans, trade is toxic. You can't talk trade in most parts of the United States. If you are, I advocate for your straight trade, you're out of here. Um, what are we going to do about it? Because we should have freer trade. We don't want to go back to the mercantile trading practices of 1930. I heard Robert Rubin a talk in New York um, a couple of months ago. He said, we have to get health care. The guy who I mean, trade is good for us. That cheaper shirt is good for me and good for you and good for everybody. But the guy who's lost, just lost his job because his company moved to Mexico doesn't look at his shirt and say, oh, grand, my shirt was made in Indonesia, so everything's fine. He's upset. He complains to his congressperson. And they're not going to buy into this. Why is he upset? Because he's losing his job. In many, many instances, it's because he's losing his health care. If you're losing your job and keep your health care, then you can go try someplace else. Otherwise, you're in terrible trouble. So I think right now we are frozen and moving ahead on the freer trade agenda. The bank and the fund are trying to back away from the very, very rigorous policies on how you must be totally capitalist. It was following in the 1990s. Russia has just said the hell with it and we'll do our own thing. But we're in a very tight situation here. It's not just in the United States. If we lose the impetus on trade, uh, third world countries are going to suffer. People in those countries are going to suffer. And the situation could regress. So I would be glad to answer questions for as long as I can. Don't have to question.